Uh, welcome. Uh, let's start the service by singing 294. Uh, let's stand and sing 294. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. <coughs> Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, march beneath thy tender care. In thy pleasant flesh and feed us, for our use thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast taught us. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us thy we are. We are thine, do to befriend us, Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Michelle, will you uh, open the service of prayer? Dear Father, I want to thank you for this very work of uh, can still come here together in church. I pray that you protect our liberty, that we can come here to worship you. Lord, help us and guide us to understand your word better. And I pray that you bless this message, Lord, and help our pastor to deliver us to them this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, let's say Senate. And for our fellowship song, we're going to sing 294, one page back. And then surely goodness and mercy, 292. Uh, and between uh, verse 2 and 3, uh, we're going to shake your hands. See you. 
shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. He restored my soul when I'm weary. He gave me strength day by day. He leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. If you're just coming in, we appreciate you coming and joining us. Appreciate those who stuck around, uh, especially we've had a crazy day today. So I'm going to address that head on by just saying that if you weren't here in the morning service, uh, we had a very disruptive person come into the church and had to escalate to the point of actually literally calling the police to get them to leave. Uh, now, this person is somebody who a lot of you will know, and that's what makes it sad. Um she is. And let me just say this for anybody who's online, because you may need to know this, because the only reason I'm addressing it now is she has contacted people. Apparently, I didn't realize this uh, and tries to cause problems for people in the past. I thought she only harassed me. So I, I didn't say anything about the problems because I thought she only harassed me. So if she's only harassing me, it's fine. I like I told Safanya about what she was saying, uh, but it was between me and him. Then the last time she caused a big fuss, I think I talked to some of the men about it. So they knew what was going on. But I never expected her to come into church and cause problems. And I didn't expect her to cause problems with people. Uh, and so I'm talking about Leah Meto, uh, that she has, if you don't know this about her, she has schizophrenia. She has some severe mental issues. And so that's why I've always been very patient with her. I've, 
when she attacks me and calls me everything you can think of, I take it, I accept it because I know it's coming from that. Uh, however, I also know that she messes with stuff that's not right. She messes with uh, beliefs in witchcraft. I mean, she believes she can talk to animals and things of that nature, uh, which some of that's schizophrenia, some of that's witchcraft, because some of it comes from the church where she comes from in Kenya, that they do teach some witchcraft mixed into things. Uh, and so I've always tried to be very patient with her, very sympathetic to it, knowing where it's coming from. Uh, I've tried to be you know, accepting of her. And try to help her. But today was the final, I can't have somebody coming in church acting like that. Uh, I know even if you don't have full control, I can't have that. Uh, there has to be a line for stuff. Uh, and so if she had behaved remotely respectfully and at least left when I asked her to, that would be one thing. Uh, but if you weren't here to see it, I'm going to clip it out of the video so you won't be able to watch it for long. You can see some of it maybe until I do that. Uh, but uh, she came in the church like she was drunk. Now, I know she was. I don't think she was. I think it was the other issue that she always has. But she came in the church like she was drunk, waving a bottle of milk over her head uh, as she walked around this way to go back to the bathroom and then come out that way and go sit down over here in the front, I think. Or maybe she'd come back this way. But uh, she left a bottle of milk back there and come and sat down. And when she come in with the milk, she started yelling that the crazy lady is here. Uh, and I just ignored it at first. And when she come out and she was still being loud and saying the crazy ladies here and a bunch of stuff, I told her, you know, to sit down. That's not relevant. Be respectful to the service uh, and so forth. She didn't listen to any of that. And then when we started singing, she got up and started dancing and making a lot of disruptions. So I just went and asked her nice. If you didn't hear what I was saying, I asked her nicely to leave. I said, you know, that's, that's enough. I, I gave you a chance, but you're not being respectful. So I need you to go. Uh, she didn't want to go. So I tried to get her purse to get her to go. Because normally if you take somebody's purse, my dad was security guard. So I know some of the techniques you have to do. Uh, if you get somebody's purse and you walk them out, uh, they'll go because they're not going to let you take their purse and walk away with it. So that's why I took her purse. Uh, she, I tried to nudge her. Like I, I you can't grab somebody and physically pick them up and carry them out. You'll get in trouble for that, as Jonas also pointed out. But, uh, but I tried to get her arm and get her to go because you can do a little bit of that as long as you're not too rough with somebody. So I tried to get her to go, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't go, so I left her alone, uh, and I called the police. Uh, we had to get everybody ready in case the police come, because you never know what kind of problems the police can make when they come to something. That's why I don't like to call them to anything I don't have to, because you call them to help you, but they come looking for what can they give you problems about. It's the craziest thing in the world. That's why every lawyer I know says, don't talk to the police anything you don't have to, uh, because you're trying to be nice and help them to solve the problem you called them for, but they're looking for, well, what can I give you a ticket for? Uh, so that's why I don't like to call them. Uh, but, uh, when she heard me on the phone with the police at that point, JP and Gail had already appealed to her some. So was, between that and knowing the police were on their way, she followed me to the door and began to yell in the phone to the police, uh, that they're going to take me away, not her. So then she got mad and she walked down the street and I watched her until she walked out of sight. Now I'm explaining that because I don't want to sour a second service with that, but it's kind of hard to avoid it when it's what has happened today. And most people in the room know about it, but also need to address it because there's some people who may not know about it because you just come in or you may not know about it because you're online. But I'm saying it because I don't normally tell people don't talk to I, I think it's really crazy when I see a church where when the pastor has a falling out with somebody, he makes a public statement. You're not allowed to talk to them. that's to me. That's a cult. When the pastor start makes public statements, you're not allowed to talk to this person anymore. Uh, I'm going to recommend, though, to people that you just leave her alone. Uh, I mean, she has contacted multiple people. She's caused some trouble with some, with some other people. Some of them, I understood it. And so I didn't think nothing about it when I knew she was contacting them because they're from Kenya as well. So it made sense. You know, they're from the same country. Uh, she has somewhat of a friendship with them. I, I understood that she would contact them. Uh, but now that I know a little better, I feel like that's not what she was doing. She wasn't talking to her friends because I know for a fact she's tried to stir problems with people and was talking bad about the church and stuff. Uh, and even that, it's if you want to, if you want to go to a church and say, I love the church while also being buddies with somebody who's attacking it, that's your business. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It'd be like me saying, I love my wife and then hanging out with people who say bad stuff about her. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, now that's your business though, but for your own benefit, just because of the fact she is mixed up in a lot of bad stuff, she is, she has huge psychological swings and breaks. Uh, and According to her doctor, she doesn't remember any of it when it's done. Now, I have a hard time with that because she'll quote back stuff that she said or you said when she was having a, a fit. Uh, so I have a hard time believing she doesn't remember any of it. Uh, but because of the nature of that, I'm going to recommend, I'm making a public statement to recommend to anybody if she contacts you, just 
use your own judgment, but I recommend you don't you don't follow through with any further contact with her because I, I recommend you pray for her. I, I really highly do that. I really ask you to pray for her because I'm not I'm not treating her like she's some enemy that you know you we have to be against her. We have to say stuff. No, don't talk about her. Don't worry about her. Just pray for her. But don't open yourself up to any more problems that may come from because I've been through this multiple times and took the attacks, took the stuff and thought that over time she would, I'd be able to help her and she'd get better. And I found that's not how it works. Uh, so everybody's benefit. If she contacts you, I recommend you just close it down and don't talk to her. Um, like I said, I don't often do that. I, the only other time I did that was when people were friends with John from Hong Kong. When he started sending me videos claiming he was demon possessed, I recommended people not talk to him. Now, I obviously didn't check anybody's phones and tell them, you know, you're not allowed to talk to him. I just, I recommend it. Don't talk to him. Uh, so it's not often I have to make a statement like that. But in this case, I do feel like it's necessary. There's not many people. In fact, there's only one person I know of who's not allowed to come back to the church because of the fact that I, he's preyed on people and caused problems, not just here, but at other places. Uh, and so once I found out what he was doing, I, I told him he's not allowed here. The men made that. I let the men vote on that, make that decision. I didn't make that by myself. Uh, so there's only one other person who I've told him they're not allowed. But because of the fact that this is not a one time problem, this is something I've been trying to help her with for at this point over. I mean, I've been help, helping her with this since the beginning of COVID, I guess. Uh, I've been working with her on this stuff. Uh, so for almost two years now, I've been trying to help her. Uh, and if it was attacking me, I, I'll tolerate it. I'll accept that. It's no problem in the world. But when it comes to the church, I have to draw a line there. So for Leah, if you see her, if you see any evidence she's trying to come to church, you let me know in advance and we'll have somebody because I'm not going to let her through the door next time because I'm not going to have her fighting with me in the service trying to force me to call the police to have her removed because she doesn't want to go again. Uh, I'm not going to... I can talk to her personally. I'll talk to her as an individual and try to help her. She's not, I never blocked her. I've always had her messages where I can receive them and try to help her. I'll still continue to try to help her. I'll continue to pray for her, but she's just not going to come here and cause us problems in the church. Uh, I, that's the only way I know to handle something like that. So I apologize. It's a rather lengthy introduction and welcoming you to churches, uh, but it is something that I do feel like I need it to address to make a public statement on it and also for people who weren't here to know what's going on uh, as to what's happened today. It was, it was one of those days where at the time I walked in the service, I could tell something's going on. She wasn't even here yet. And I could tell something was going on because it just spiritually, it was like the, the devil was poking all the children. It felt like, I mean, it's like he was pinching them, poking them, whatever, because the children were going crazy. Uh, and it was, Stefania was going crazy. You know. No, it was, but it was one of those things. Just spiritually, you could tell something was off. I could feel it from the time, not from the time I got here, but from early into the, before the service had ever started, I could feel something is, something's off. Something's going to happen today. I didn't expect that. I was expecting somebody to come and tell me they're mad about something or whatever, uh, the kind of stuff you normally deal with, you know, the, the, the normal issues. Uh, I wasn't expecting a, a full blown outburst in the middle of church. Uh, and I, I, I have some stuff I want to say about it, but I, I won't say uh, out of respect for everybody. But OK, with that said, I'm going to ask then if. Uh, yeah, I tell you what, we'll mix the songs up a little bit. I'll actually let Jared come and do the next song to give you a break before you get your announcements. Uh, so, Jared, if you'll come do 289, Does Jesus Care? Page 289, Does Jesus Care? Jesus care when my heart is pain to deep before mirth and song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh, yes, he, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary along, nights dreary, I know my Savior, your care. 
Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into the night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh, yes, he, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is thought with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night's dread, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When from my deep grief I had no relief. Though my tears flow all the night long. Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dread. I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it all to him does he see? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dream. I know my Savior cares. All right. I'll ask uh, Jared if you'll sit here. I'm going to give you the trivia questions so you can familiarize yourself with them. And I'm going to ask JP if he'll come and give you the services for this week, what's going on. Good afternoon. Don't listen to the cheese. I'm trying to look through the paper. Tuesday, we have our Bible study. Our live stream Bible study will begin at 7 o'clock on YouTube and Facebook. Our pastor will be bringing the lesson from our study of wisdom in the Bible as he will speak on wisdom versus foolishness. This study will attempt to show the contrast between the wise man and the fool. On Wednesday, we will have also a Bible study. And if you're able, please join us for the meal before the midweek service at 6 o'clock. Our service begins at 7, at which point we will take time to pray for one another. If you have a request you would like us to pray for, please text that to Pastor Haley before Wednesday. On around uh, uh, 7.45, sorry, the live stream will begin as we begin our verse-by-verse study of Hebrews. This week's message will be in Hebrews chapter 3 and will concern how we rob ourselves of rest. We also will have a street preaching January the 22nd at 2 o'clock in the Koromarkt. This will be our first time back this year, so please be sure to set aside time to represent our church and be part of giving the gospel. We will spend an hour giving gospel tracts, then after that our pastor will preach. Saturday evening, 7 o'clock, we will have our live Q&A. We will have a live question and answer service. We will be joined by Pastor Florin Stancha from Romania and Pastor Zoltan Kis from Hungary. 
We will be answering the questions, should a church be seeker sensitive? And also, is God concerned with how we worship? We will also look to answer any other question you have about these subjects. If you ask them while we are live. Sunday morning and midday, next Sunday, we will continue our study of the I am statements of Jesus. That will feature in both services throughout January. In the morning, we will look at uh, the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And in the afternoon, we will look at, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> All right. I also want to mention, if you didn't see the live stream from last night, I heard it went fine. Everything was okay. Uh, but for the live stream from last night, I did one where it was me and Brother Abraham Klein, we were doing a reaction, wherein we take something and we talk about it, we discuss it. I, I'm still learning the format some, so I've got a little bit less reaction, a little more, to be honest with you, I don't know what you call it, but podcast is what they, the way they do those, is that you sit down with a guest and you talk about stuff. So in all in reality, it's probably more of a podcast than it's a reaction at this point, unless I can find a way to clip in some stuff from Brother Branch reacting to things. Uh, but that was the intention for this one. This was this is my promotion of it. It was intended to be about a 15-minute conversation about a song that Safania had showed me that was the song that the first time a homosexual made it onto the iTunes uh, top, you know, like 100 or whatever Christian songs. Uh, it was the first time a homosexual performer has ever done that. This was a song I think that they've done it for. It's called I'd Rather Be a Ghost. It's, uh, it's a song that, as far as I understand, most people interpret it as being a, someone who's writing, someone who's transgender singing. Uh, and so it actually wound up being a very deep conversation, or at least a deep enough conversation I mean, uh, about getting to talk about homosexuality, uh, transgender, you know, people hating their own bodies, uh, contemporary music, and how the contemporary movement as a whole actually pushes people to this by not helping them spiritually, uh, but just trying to appeal to their senses. Uh, and so it was a really good conversation. I enjoyed it. I thought it was going well enough that I just went ahead and I let it run. I wound up making a 15 minutes into a 50 minute conversation. Uh, so I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I think it's good for you if you want to know why, for example, I don't believe in using contemporary music. There's the first 15 minutes will answer that question for you. It's a simplified answer, but it's a 15, you know, 15 minute answer. If you want to know uh, some other good, helpful stuff, watch the whole thing. Uh, but Brother Klein really brought some good stuff to it because of the fact that I never really thought about uh, his health issues he's had in the past, or still has. I mean, he still has the, the trach in his neck and all of that. Uh, but I never really thought about how that would affect him. So that there's been, of course, times where, you know, I do remember now that there was actually a point that he was, people asked me to pray for him because he was ready to give up. Like he just, he wasn't going to do any more surgeries. He wasn't going to do anything. He was just going to accept his fate. Uh, and so I remember reaching out to him and trying to encourage him in that time. And so he began to share about some of that. And it really went well with what we were talking about. It really spoke to uh, how when you need help, you know, and somebody's trying to help you take the advice, it may sting a little bit, but take it. Uh, and so actually I put a little stinger at the beginning of the video of him talking about that because I just thought it was really powerful. It was really good. Uh, so I encourage you if you got some time, you know, if you hadn't seen it yet to go back and listen to that one. I'm going to invite Lori back because I had an extra song to the service. So uh, I'm going to invite Lori back to the piano uh, as we're going to sing... Uh, page 264 in the garden. Page, we we're listening to the radio this morning and that was on. And I realized we haven't sung that in a long time. I think I'm supposed to sing it later this month, but I don't care. We're going to sing it now. Uh, in the garden, page 264. Two hundred and sixty-four in the garden. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God is close and he was 
joy we share as we tarry there. Not other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. All right, now I'm going to let uh, Jared to come and do the trivia for you. Uh, so JP's got the candy bucket. Let me mention on the food for Wednesday night, uh, the, the reason why that was not mentioned in the announcements themselves is my mic on here. Okay, please. Uh, but um, the reason that was not mentioned is because there was a big uh, mix-up that because Lori switched places with Joe, somehow I processed it that they were switching one this week, one last week. Uh, so Eli messaged me wanting to know if he could cook because he'll be off work still even though he's out of quarantine. He's fine by that point, theoretically. Uh, he wanted to know if he would be uh, – if he could cook. So I said, okay, you'll talk to Joe because her and Jonas are supposed to cook. But then I went to go make the calendar and I realized it's not Joe and Jonas, it's Rebecca and Stefania that we're going to be cooking. Uh, so then I had to send Eli a message this morning saying, talk to them. Uh, so by the time I printed the announcements, it was too late to change anything. So I just marked it out and I said, we'll figure it out when we get here. Uh, so as far as I know, Eli is cooking this Wednesday night. Uh, and then they're going to sign up for whenever the next available date is. And I think they have next week. So eventually, Joe and Jonas, it's not next week, then Lori's shaking her head. No, it's beyond that. Somewhere down the road, uh, Joe and Jonas are cooking, uh, and they are cooking. But this week, it's theoretically Eli. So, you know. All right. Now you can come. Um, the first question uh, from uh, this morning. Oh, uh, this morning. Yeah. Uh, what two, what two I am statements are found in John ten? One per person. Yeah. Mich uh, Michelle. Michelle. And yes. Yep. And the other one. Yeah. Every everyone trying to find different ways to God is called. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. You have the answers. Yeah. <laughs> I go through a lot of extra work to write those answers down yeah. for you. I, I, I thought uh, there's two answers. Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it. Nick. Yes. <clears throat> All others are come to do what three things? One answer per person. Maybe give your mom a chance. Yes. 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 One more. 
It's not kill. You, you said kill first, right? Yeah, kill is the one we're looking for. Yeah, that's the right one. Jesus' sheep know him by what? No, 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 no. He's already either. Right, right. Josiah. All right. Not personal. It's just. By, yeah, by his voice. Right. Try, I'm trying to teach him to spread the wealth because he has a bad habit because you're in front of him. Or... Yeah. <laughs> I think Josiah was the last one. Yeah, Josiah said it last, week it, last week it was Stefania, I think, that I had to stop him. Like, calm yeah. down, calm down. Yeah. You got to look around the room. Give it a second to breathe. Okay. The gate and the way that lead to destruction are. Now you can follow everyone. Matthew. Matthew. Yes. That's what you gotta do. You look for people you haven't called on yet and try to spread the wealth around. Okay. The gate and the, no, the gate and the way that lead to life are. Ariana. No. Yes. 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 The gate is so narrow it is only wide enough for what? Yes. No. Emily also had, yeah. had it Emily had the second possible answer. So. Yeah. Emily, Emily had the second possible Matthew 24 says, The coming of the Son of Man shall be like what? Rob. Can you think of something else that it's like? Or? Lightning. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to help you out. Actually. Yeah. I mean, it is true, just not not from yeah. the passage we're asking. So, it's lighting up. The, the, you can give him a piece. The later part of Matthew twenty four says. I mean, it it does say in Matthew twenty four. What is he thinking? To? <laughs> uh, what does it mean in Matthew twenty four that where the carcass is, there is eagles with will gather. Yeah, that's good. Mike. God told Cain because his sacrifice was evil, sin had to lay where? Jonas. Was that what you were going to say to her? <laughs> she was correct. I thought maybe you were going to tell the question. Emily, you have to be called on. You can't just yell answers. <laughs> what does it mean? That sin life at the door. Josiah's got a thing in place. What do you say? Sure, that's true. Do you have a different answer? Or what you going to say too? Not what he was going to bring, but that was not that's fine. I'll, I'll give you a point for that. I mean, not all the kids keep stealing away your candy. What did Cain and Abel bring as sacrifice? One answer per request per person. Which one brought it? Which one brought it? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So the only question is, what did Abel bring? Yes, I no. Uh, no. A lamb was what. Uh, yeah, but that's fine. You, you can you can have. I think all the kids at this point say lamb, so you can just make a round. All the kids. Yeah, can we begin? What does each sacrifice represent? One answer per per person. Yeah, so, what does Cain's sacrifice represent? All right. This works. Did that uh, answer question? Yeah. Is that allowed? <laughs> and Abel? Yeah, but the blood's good. I'll take yeah. blood. There's another. I'll take a second answer for the question. I'll, I'll take blood. That's fine. But uh, there's a second answer I will accept for what Abel sacrifice represents. <laughs> True. That's not the one I'm talking about. She has, she has enough candy. She's fine. <laughs> Good, good job, Emily. I give you a point. Right. You have enough candy. You 
the same way that blood's true. I mean, that's true, but I'm looking for a very specific answer Stephania. that would be the opposite of works. Stephania. Grace. Yes. <laughs> that's the same way in true. That blood is true. Jesus is true. Faith is true. But I'm looking for grace in there. So. What did the door on the ark protect Noah and his family from? Nick. Yeah. yeah. What did their doors and the blood on them protect the people from at the Passover? Yeah. That's good. You did okay. That was that was one question more than what you normally get. So they just have people here to spread the wealth around. So <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think of this way I could stretch it out for you a little bit more, but that's too much work. <clears throat> All right, Jared, I don't know where you're going because you got to come lead us in singing 112 Blessed Redeemer. Uh, so Jared's going to come and lead in singing 112 Blessed Redeemer. Precious 
Christ's Redeemer. Seems now I see Him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. All right, let's go and take our Bible. We'll pick up right where we left off and try to finish most of the other themes of the passage. As in reality, most of the rest of the passage that we didn't get to actually is about the shepherd. I was going to do the verses in the order they were there, but after the distraction this morning, I had to make some adjustments. Uh, And so it's fine because it actually allows us to focus on what the passages are actually about and put the attention where it should be. So John chapter number 10, we read through to verse 10. Uh, I will begin reading in verse 11. I will trust that you know what comes before this, uh, wherein he discusses that his sheep know his voice and they will not answer the voice of another. Uh, But we're going to begin in verse 11 and we're going to read through to verse 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth the wolf, uh, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, and other sheep have I, I have, uh, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold uh, and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Well, we thank you and praise you, God, for what you do. We thank you for this privilege and the blessing it is just to be in your house today, uh, for this opportunity to just share in your word and spend time studying here. I pray, God, that you would help us to walk away with a deep appreciation for your love and care of us and our relationship to you. I just pray, Father, you would work in this in such a mighty way that your voice would be heard, your will be made known in many of our lives. We ask it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Now, looking at this passage, if you don't know what comes before it, understand this. The chapter begins with a parable. Uh, Jesus calls it a parable, so it is a parable. Uh, It's one of the few times you can't argue about it because he says it. Uh, But Jesus starts off with a parable where he talks about his sheep. And he says that his sheep know his voice. And they won't answer to the voice of somebody else. And that anyone who's ever come before him offering another door or another way to get into the sheepfold is a robber and a thief. Uh, And now he's trying to help us understand that that robber and thief in the verses just prior to this has only come to steal and to kill and to destroy. They're not trying to help someone in right, but instead they're trying to go around God's way to heaven. Uh, And so they're there to destroy. So this morning we talked about that I am the door, what he says prior to this, where he's making it clear. This is what happens is he gives the parable. People don't understand it, so he explains it. The beginning of the explanation is that he is the door. If you don't get it, you don't understand the parable, he wants you to understand that he is the only way to get to heaven. He's the only way to be part of God's sheepfold. Uh, And so because he's the only way to get there, he is God's way that was settled before the foundation of the world that anyone who tries to go another way is trying to rob and steal from God. They're trying to steal and kill and destroy. So then you take that, you go into these verses, and he begins to explain the parts about the shepherd. And he very plainly tells you up front what it means to be the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd because I lay my life down for the sheep. Uh, And then he goes in to explain in the verses following that that we just read, the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. Now, a hireling is someone who has been hired. That's why it's a hireling. They have been hired to take care of the sheep. It's not their sheep. It's not their livelihood. They don't care. I'm just here to collect a paycheck. You know, I'm just watching these sheep for a little while. I'll get paid and I'll go on with my life. Whether the sheep are healthy doesn't matter to me. Whether the sheep are well taken care of doesn't matter to me. 
If something comes and attacks the sheep, I'm not going to defend them because I'm not getting paid for that. I'm getting paid by the hour. Uh, you know, I am a hireling. Uh, it's the difference between when somebody has their own business and you're an employee at that business. Uh, when you're an employee, especially like a temporary employee, you're not really worried about the bottom line. You're not worried about the health and success of a company. You're just worried about collecting your hourly wage and going home for that day. Whereas when it's your company or you're the boss or you're the manager or you know, you're in a position of leadership, of authority of some kind, or you're someone who you count on this place for your livelihood, you care a little bit more. And I know this, I mean, especially from when I worked in a factory, you could tell the difference between who was a hireling and who actually counted this as their job. Because the hirelings, as soon as that clock uh, come time to punch out, they were lined up at the door fighting each other to get to it. When there was a problem, they wouldn't do anything to try to fix it. If they needed someone to stay a little longer, they wouldn't ever do anything. They just they were interested only in what was the bare minimum requirement to get a paycheck. And that was what the hireling. Someone who actually was part of the company and really cared about it, they gave a little bit. They would make sacrifices sometimes. I, I would fix stuff on my own break because they didn't have a maintenance man. So I would go get my tools out of the car and come fix their machine for them uh, because I realized I wanted people to have a job next week, not just today. Uh, I wanted it to be a healthy company. Uh, I remember I was sharing this with Lori the other day, and this maybe can help illustrate what I'm trying to say a little bit more, is I remember there was one time where they were closing down for the weekend, and it was maybe even a holiday weekend or something, but they were getting ready to close down, and they had messed up the order of our biggest customer over and over and over again until that customer said, it's done. If you don't have it on Monday, we're not doing business with you anymore. And if that customer pulled out, the owner of the company already said, he's pulling out, it's done. The doors will be closed. Uh, so you know, take your stuff home with you this weekend because it may be closed permanently on Monday and you're not getting it back. Uh, so I went because I cared. I didn't want you know 150 people to be out of a job. Uh, I went and on my break when everybody else was eating and complaining about how I guess this is our last day, I went through and I started doing inventory. And I picked out everything we had from other people's jobs that could wait. And I put it all together in a pile and said, look, we have half the job done now. Just do this other half. You can do that today. You can do that tonight. You can do that. You know, pull from here and there. And I went through and did that stuff for me, even though it wasn't my job, because I cared. I didn't want people to be unemployed on Monday. There's a difference, you see, between somebody who actually cares about something and somebody who's a hireling. They make a sacrifice. They give of themselves. They invest themselves. Now, Jesus explains it perfectly simple and perfectly good without any of my extra illustrations. The difference is that the hireling is there to collect his wage. He does not care about the livelihood of the sheep because his financial benefit doesn't require that the sheep live for slaughter time. It doesn't require that they live long enough to be sheared. They just have to make it through today. And at the end of the day, if the wolf comes and gets them before the day's over with, I get paid for the hours they were okay. I mean, that's enough for me. Uh, you know, That's his care. That's his only concern. That is his bottom line. Whereas Jesus says he is the good shepherd because a shepherd cares for their sheep. A shepherd is willing to invest. They care about what's going to happen. They want to make sure they have a good pasture. They want to make sure they have what they need. But that's just what it means to be a shepherd. The good shepherd, he says he is because he's willing to go farther. He's willing to die for his sheep. He says a shepherd may be willing to, you know, hit the wolf with a stick or, you know, shoot it with the slingshot or do something to try to chase it off. You know, he'll put up a little bit of a fight before he runs away, whereas the hireling runs away as soon as he sees it. Uh, the shepherd might put up a fight, but the good shepherd's willing to die if that's necessary because the sacrifice is so great for him. So he tells you up front what this means. And in fact, I'm going to preach this message maybe in reverse order of what I had intended to. It's similar to what I did this morning. Uh, but I want you to understand when it comes to the idea of being good, the Bible gives you an understanding of what that looks like. Romans 5 is one of the best places to understand the difference between someone who's just and someone who's good and so forth. In Romans chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, the Bible tells us that scarcely for a just man would someone die. Yet peradventure for a good man many would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. So there he actually raises it higher than what is even said here of good. Because here he's talking about I die for those who are mine, whereas there he's saying I died for those who hate me. I died for everybody. So he's actually raising it higher than what's listed here in John 10 and Romans 5. I want you to understand that before I get there. But to understand what it truly means to be good in terms of the Bible, good is when you go beyond what is required. What is the baseline of this is what it should be. The way I've always illustrated this is if you have someone who you do business with 
and that person charges you a fair rate, they do a fair job, they walk away, then you have no special attachment to that person. You have, I've used it in the past when we were over there with all the restaurants. I used the restaurants around the church to illustrate it. I mean, you can use whatever you want, though. If you have somebody who only does what is required, you know, I'll use Nick as my example of this because his business actually is easier to reflect this. If he has someone who he's going to buy stuff from and he's going to sell it and they're only ever willing to sell for him at the exact price, they're not willing to budge, they're not willing to work with him or help him in any way, or his buyers are only willing to buy at the exact price, then he's not going to feel a special attachment to those people. Uh, he'll do business with them when he needs to, but he's not going to go out of his way. He's not going to literally cross the country to go to them like he does for the one who gives them a good price, for the one who helps him and, and works with them on stuff. That one he goes across the country to take stuff to. He'll rent a car. He'll take a train. He'll get somebody to go with him if he has to, but he'll go out of his way to get to that one because that one's good to him. That's the difference. The one that's local, and I assume he doesn't mind me using him as illustration of this. It's too late now. We're already in it. But uh, the one that's local, yeah, I'll go to him if I just need to do if I need to do business and I can't wait. I'll go there. But the one who's on the other side, I'll save my stuff up. I'll go out of my way. I'll put myself in a tight spot to do business with them because they're good to me. That's the difference between someone who's good and someone who's just. Someone who's just is just doing what is legally correct, what is required, what is necessary. The hireling in this story. The hireling is someone he's just. I mean, he's just doing his job. Nobody, nobody's paying him enough to die for that sheep. Nobody's paying him enough to go fight a wolf. You know, I guarantee whatever his hour, hourly wage is to go sit out there with those sheep while the shepherd does whatever he has to do is not enough to justify him sacrificing his life fighting a wolf or losing an arm fighting a wolf or whatever's going to happen to him fighting a wolf. I, I don't actually criticize the hireling for not wanting to be any more invested in that because he doesn't profit if the sheep survive. He profits for doing his job, and so he's going to do his job. A good person, though, is someone who goes beyond what is required. It is someone who does extra for you. So, I mean, the way I've always illustrated in the past is just that idea. Like, if you have, if you have a restaurant, when you go there, you know they don't just give you the bare minimum. They're going to put a little bit of extra on your food. You know, they're going to give you the sauces for free. They're going to give you an extra drink. They're going to give toys for the kids or stuff. You'll go out of your way. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. The chicken restaurant next to the old church building was not my favorite restaurant. We mostly went there because everybody else was their favorite. But I like the owner so much. He is such a nice guy. And the food's good. It's not. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. But he is such a nice guy, such a legitimately nice guy always giving gifts to the kids, always talking to me that I would go eat his food even if I wanted something else sometimes. Even if my desire was to go eat somewhere else, I would go eat with him because he was good to me. Because I considered him somebody who I had loyalty to because he was good to me. And that's the kind of relationships we build with people. Someone who only ever just does what's just, never goes beyond, doesn't have conversations, not friendly, not the, you know whatever. You don't feel an affinity or an attachment of any special kind to that person. But someone who goes above and beyond, you care. You feel a special care for them because that person is good to you. That's why scarcely for a just man would some die, but for a righteous man, many peradventure would dare to die. I mean, for a, for a good man, many would peradventure dare to die. When someone goes above and beyond, you want to go a little bit extra for them. Now, saying that and then trying to put that in the understanding of this passage, Jesus is saying that I'm not a hireling. I'm not just doing what's required of me. And he adds an extra layer when he says, I'm not even just a normal shepherd who does what, you know, what's more than, you know, what's required, but it's still just what's expected of you. Because again, you expect certain things of people. It takes a little bit more to go above just and reach the level of good. Someone who's just does just what's required. Someone who goes a little bit above that, you know, that's fine. You appreciate that. You know, they put some extra tissues or napkins or whatever in my, my bag. I appreciate that of them. You know, I appreciate that they, they didn't mess up my order. You know, that you appreciate certain things. But it takes going a little bit above that before you start calling somebody truly good. When you start to see somebody as good to you. I don't say somebody's good to me because they put extra napkins in my bag. Uh, McDonald's does it sometimes, and McDonald's doesn't care anything about me whatsoever. Uh, I am not even a dollar, a euro sign to them. I'm not, I'm not worth pennies to them. Uh, they don't care. They put the extra napkins there because they pay somebody who also doesn't care. They don't care about the value of them, uh, so they throw them in. It's just a whole bunch of people not caring. That's what it comes down to. So somebody doing a little bit extra, 
Somebody putting a little bit of care or so doesn't really mean that much to you. It's when somebody goes well beyond what you could ask of them, what is normal to be asked. And that's why Jesus says he's the good shepherd, because he lays down his life for his sheep. And in the passage, there's something really important to be understood about that. In the passage, he makes it abundantly clear to you that nobody is making him die. Nobody is killing him or murdering him. Nobody is forcing him to do this. He willingly is doing this. And we understand that because we understand that at any moment he could have called down legions of angels. He could have put a stop to this. He did not have to be crucified. He did not have to let them spit on him. He did not have to let them beat him. He did not have to let them take and tie him to that whipping post and beat him until the Bible says there was no beauty to be desired of him. He didn't have to do any of that. He could have stopped it at any moment. Now the truth is, here's where I want you to understand something about being good. Do you think that in reality it was required that he had to take so much beating or was the blood sacrifice enough? I mean, the lambs didn't get beat on the altar. They slit their throat, they let the blood out, they burned the dead body. I honestly in my heart believe the more I've studied this, the reason why his death was so bloody, so violent, so cruel, why God didn't just have it be a simple sacrifice was to reflect the high cost of sin. Because in reality, the high cost of sin and the transaction that's going on on the cross is going on in a way you can't see it. In fact, the closest you'll ever get to seeing it is in the Garden of Gethsemane, wherein he is so overwhelmed and so pressed by the weight and the burden of sin that he begins to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. That's the closest you're ever going to get to understanding what was going on on the cross and what the real transaction actually looked like, what it took to satisfy the wrath of God and what your sin really cost. When you see that the weight of it alone, we're not even talking about God's wrath, just the weight of your sin was so much that it pushed his body to the point of breaking, to where human flesh almost could not bear it. That's what he was pushed to, the point God sent an angel to minister unto him. So in reality, if Jesus had just died, an easy sacrifice, if they had slit his throat like a lamb and let him bleed out on the altar, if they had just nailed him to a cross and let him bleed out on a cross then in reality, you would have walked away from that not fully appreciating just what your sin really caused. I believe the primary reason why it had to be so bloody and so violent, why it's by his stripes and by his wounds, is because in those, if you pay attention, Isaiah 53, one of the main points of the chapter is to who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. It's about getting you to understand who the Messiah is, who Jesus is, and what he's doing. As he's going through that chapter and talking about stuff, so I believe one of the reasons why he let them beat him is because he wanted you to know. I believe that's the primary reason. He wanted you to know and understand what sin really cost. I believe that's the reason for your Old Testament sacrifices. Because God says the blood of bulls and goats can never fully atone for sin. It was never going to be enough. It was not sufficient to satisfy the wrath of God. That these were just meant to picture and point us to Christ and the sacrifice that he would make. So the same way those things were done so that every time you went to the altar and you made a sacrifice, you were being reminded, this is what sin cost. You didn't think that lie counted for much, but this is what it counted to for God. You didn't think that evil thought, that thing that you've been imagining, that thing you've lusted after, you don't think it matters much because it's all in your mind and nobody's hurt by it. This is what it means to God. It cost so much that lamb had to be sacrificed. That's what the blood sacrifices were about. It was showing you the high cost of sin. That every liar has his part in the lake that burns with fire. That every sin must be judged. That every sin is worthy of condemnation. That's what the sacrifices were teaching you. So what did the cruelty of Jesus' sacrifice teach you even more? This is what sin cost. Next time you think it's not a big deal, you think it's a little innocent thing, whatever evil thing it is that we do, and we try to justify it saying, I didn't hurt anybody, it's not a big deal. God says, you look at the cross and tell me it's not a big deal. You look at the cross and tell me it didn't hurt anybody. You look at the cross and tell me it doesn't matter because there was no victim. You look at the cross and say, it's not an issue. I shouldn't have to be upset about this. That's what the cross is showing you. Now, the reason why that's important is understand this. If that's true, what I just said to you, then that means He went above what was necessary to be the sacrifice for your sins. That means that in reality, to satisfy the wrath of God, 
he could have had the cup of sin poured out on him, and he could have been slain on the altar just like one of those lambs were. And he didn't have to. He didn't have to be beat with the fists of the people watching. He didn't have to have them pull the hairs of his beard. He didn't have to be spit on. He didn't have to be taken to the Roman whipping post. He didn't have to have the crown of thorns. He didn't have to have any of those things. He just had to shed his blood on God's altar and pay for our sin, having the cup of God's wrath poured out on him with our sin. Now, you can debate whether you agree with that or not, but if that's true, then what that means is that everything He took beyond shedding His blood for us was goodness. It wasn't what was just and necessary of a Redeemer. It was going above and beyond. It was taking the extra step so that you didn't just get salvation. You got what you needed in the salvation. You got a lesson. You got an understanding of how sin is destructive and evil. You got a lesson of how sin is not something to be played with because if you ever open the door and let it creep into your life, it is going to creep in more and more and it's going to destroy you. That little thought, that little temptation, that little lust that you felt like it's not a big deal and you've thought about it and you've let that thing stay in your heart, that greed, that envy, whatever it is, that you've let it have a place in your heart because you don't think it's a big deal. God says it's such a big deal that if you let it fester, it will destroy you, it will will kill you and it means so much to him and it's so evil in his eyes that if you don't do something about it this is what has to be done to it God's son has to go to the cross and die to pay for that sin that sin is not light it's not small it's not a toy it's not something you can play with it is something so evil and despicable that God's son had to be beaten, he had to suffer, he had to die. That's what was necessary for sin to be paid for. I believe that's why his sacrifice was so bloody and so cruel. It was so you and I would walk away saying sin's not something to be played with. I mean, you think about this sometimes. Sometimes you punish certain things your children do more severely than it probably needs because you want to break them of that and make sure they never do that again. There's some things you jump on it now and you attack it right now because you want to make sure that never happens again. There are things, when you look at God's legal system that He gives a death penalty to that will leave you scratching your head when you read that, that they could kill somebody for that, they could stone somebody to death for that in Israel until you realize that God is shutting down sin before it ever has a chance to become something more evil than that. He's shutting down things that are perverse that we look at today as being almost nothing because if you ever cut on your computer, you've probably seen worse than that because He's shutting it down before it comes something truly, genuinely despicable and evil. He shuts down lying at the first step because He defends the truth with everything. He shuts down all these things because He wants you to walk away saying sin cannot be played with. I cannot toy with this and treat it like it's nothing. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? That's what he's wanting you to say when you see sin, is that I cannot play with fire anymore. This will destroy me. I have to get rid of it. And when you think about it in those terms and realize that if it be true that Jesus could have just died a much more simple death, just the shedding of his blood there on the cross, taking that blood and sprinkling it on the mercy seat, because as I look at the Old Testament sacrifices, that's what seems to be necessary. I don't, I don't recall much, you know, beating of the uh, the ox with the cat of nine tails. I don't remember them getting a crown of thorns beat into their skull until the blood began to swell up in their head. I don't recall a lot of that kind of level of suffering. It was the shedding of blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It was the shedding of blood, and that blood being sprinkled on God's mercy seat that satisfied the wrath of God. It was that those people who trusted the blood that was shed. So if that was what was necessary, that was the cost. And that means everything he took beyond those nails in his hands and his feet, everything beyond that he took was goodness that he was showing to you. Now I'll be honest, it's all goodness because he didn't know you nothing. It's all goodness because he could have let you die and go to hell and he didn't know a single thing to you. But as a shepherd who loves his sheep, as a savior who came to be a sacrifice, I want you to understand, he went beyond what was required. He went beyond. I mean, you think about it, even Romans 5, 8 shows you he went beyond. Because he said some would die for a good man. But God commended his love toward us. Isn't that why we're the sinners? Christ died for us. Now his point he's making is in the opposite of what John's making. John is talking about the fact that Jesus is more than just a shepherd. He's more than just a hireling. He is someone, and I understand Jesus is making this point, but he's making the point that he is someone who loves his sheep so much he would die for them. Whereas in Romans, Paul is being used to make the point 
that if you were good, you could understand why God might would be willing to die for you. If you were just, you might could make that argument. But you're not good nor just. You're a sinner. You're a sinner who was transgressing the very law of God. The very thing he's being killed for is the thing you're doing wrong. The thing that you treat so small, the thing that you allow and accept in your life. Those things what is what he is dying for. And yet he loved you enough he was willing to die for you. So when it comes to understanding and appreciating God's goodness, just keep unpacking. There's no limit to it. You cannot begin to fathom or comprehend how great and deep God's goodness towards you is. I mean, the very fact that you exist in His world, that He allows you to live, even though we're such a parasite in many ways, that He allows us to continue to live here, breathe His air, doesn't charge you anything, doesn't make you do anything to deserve that. He just gives it to you. That is His goodness being shown every day. He even says Himself, the fact that He allows it to rain on the just and the unjust is His goodness being shown to every man. God's goodness doesn't just begin at the cross. God was good to you before Jesus ever went and died on the cross. The fact that He didn't wipe you off the face of this earth the moment you stepped out in sin is enough to show that God is good to us beyond anything we can understand. Understand, and then you get to the cross, and it's just woe is me. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I can't even begin to talk about this. I can't begin to understand the full depth of God's goodness and what He does when I look at the cross. But I'm giving you that as an example because I want you to understand that even as the Redeemer, even as the sacrifice, even as the Savior, He went beyond what was probably required. He went beyond what I think anybody could ever have expected Him to do. And that's why he makes sure you understand the Romans didn't kill him. The Romans had no power to take his life. The Jews did not kill him. They had no power to take his life. He laid his life down freely. You see it first in the fact that nobody could have actually nailed him to the cross were it not for his will allowing it. Nothing can happen that God doesn't allow it or cause it. So his will had to allow it or else they couldn't do it. So you see it first in that. You see it in the fact that God who is sovereign, God who is all-powerful, God who literally just a little bit before that, that night before, He spoke and said, I am, and at the sound of His voice, He knocked an entire army to their backs. You think that they somehow could nail Him to the cross without Him stopping them if He wanted to stop them? That's one of the dumbest things you'll find in the Mormon churches that they believe Jesus didn't. He wasn't happy about it. He got mad and killed people about it. Uh, is you, if he was mad about it, he wouldn't have. They wouldn't have made it that far. There would have never been a nail in his hand if he was mad. He would have never took the first hit from the whip if he was mad about it. There's not a person. There is not the entirety of the human population throughout all of history combined could not have nailed him to that cross if he were not willing to go. But you see it, I think, even in one step further, and this is something I've addressed before from this church, from this pulpit. You see it in the fact that when scientists began to try to break down and understand how Jesus died, they always argue and disagree about the answers because doctors, people who are trained in this, have studied, and they've looked at what would have happened driving that crown of thorn in his head, and they said he should have died before he ever got there. I mean, he shouldn't have been hanging on the cross for hours. He should have died. Because the hemorrhaging in his head, the blood filling up in his skull should have been enough to put pressure on his brain and killed him. That's how that works. People die from that all the time. They said that should have been enough. But then other doctors look at it and say, in reality, the amount of blood loss he took being tied to that Roman whipping post and being beaten, he should have died from that. History tells us that. Most men didn't live that long. I mean, that's why, I mean, when you look at... uh, Pilate, even Pilate is saying the reason I'm sending him to the whipping post is I'm hoping after he takes some beating that they'll say it's enough, it's enough, you know, that uh, he won't make it to the cross. Because that whipping post was so violent and so cruel, he's hoping that'll satisfy their wrath because the cross is surely a death sentence. It's possible to survive the whipping post, but not if you take them all. Uh, If you take them all, they they say it was not unusual for a man to be ripped in half at the whipping post uh, because of how violent it was as it was ripping the meat away every time they would pull it away from you. They said it was not unusual for that to happen. Most men passed out after just a few hits. Jesus took every one of them, and they couldn't stop him. Can you imagine being beaten in such a way and then placing the cross, this huge piece of wood on your shoulders, and carrying it most of the way by yourself? It's only when they reached to a certain man that God seemed to have there for a certain reason that Jesus bowed down and let him help carry it. I understand there's more going on in that story, but there seems to be more going on in the story than what most people realize. So Jesus carries the cross to that point, Should have been dead, should have been dead two times already at least. 
blood loss at this point, if beating didn't do it, if that didn't cause him to go into cardiac arrest or something, the, the blood loss alone should have done it. So at least three times by now he should be dead. They nail him to the cross, leave him there. The amount of suffering blood loss he has, he should have suffocated in the time he was on the cross. Before he died, he should have already, he shouldn't have been out there at the last moments talking and having conversations. He should have been to the point of suffocation and death. Most people died of suffocation before they died of blood loss on the cross, especially someone who's already beaten and weak, whose bones, the Bible says, are knocked out of joint. So at least four times now he should be dead. I'm not going to count the blood loss a second time, but I mean, surely by now it's enough. You can't lose but so much before you die. And then you get to the one they pierce his side. Now, he's dead at that point. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the piercing his side should have killed him. The fact that when they pierced his side, blood and water poured out, every doctor who's ever studied that will tell you that's the number one sign that someone's heart has ruptured, that the cavity there has filled up with a mixture of blood and water. So when they pierced his side and that came pouring out, they say that should mean that his heart literally burst uh, under the weight and the stress and the pressure of what his body was going through. So at least five times there, I think I'm counting, he should have died. But none of those things killed him. Not one of them. He died when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. When he said, it is finished, then he gave up the ghost. And the Bible says it very plainly. He gave up the ghost. He chose when he died because man did not have the power to kill him. You think about it in these terms. There are multiple times, if you pay attention when you read the gospel, that it says people wanted to kill him. That they took up stones because they wanted to kill him or so forth. And as soon as he said enough was enough, it just stopped. Like you're reading a story and they take up stones to kill him. And then for some reason it says that they just stopped and he walked right through the group and just keeps on going. And nobody, it's like they're powerless to do anything. Because they were only allowed to go as far as he was allowing them to go. That's, I mean, you understand all of that, I hope. To know that when you want to talk about God's goodness, it really comes down to the fact he didn't have to be a sacrifice in the first place. He could have been a just and holy and righteous God and let you die and went to hell. And he would have been just and holy and righteous. And there's nothing anybody could ever say to accuse him. Because we chose to sin. Adam chose to sin and plunge us into sin. We are sinners by nature. I get all of that. But the human race chose to sin. We put that on ourselves. God gave us one rule and we couldn't even obey the one most simple rule He gave us. In fact, He gave every temptation to keep you away from that rule. When He told Adam that, look, you can eat the fruit of every other tree in the whole garden. Just don't touch this one. He gave him everything to keep him away from temptation. And they still went straight headway into it. Because enough is never enough for people. And God could have been holy and righteous still while letting us go to hell. He didn't know that to us. You see His goodness because He went way beyond anything you could ever ask God to do. Way beyond anything you could say would be just, righteous, correct for God to do. He went way beyond that. Because just, righteous, correct is to punish you and send you to hell for eternity. To punish me and send me to hell for eternity. Everything He has done for you beyond condemning us to hell is God's goodness manifested straight towards you. So I say you cannot begin to fathom how deep that statement is. I am the good shepherd because I laid down my life for the sheep. Because he didn't owe you anything. He didn't owe you anything. He owed you the wrath of God. He owed you punishment for sin. And yet he took it upon himself. And the layers just keep going and going and going. So to be honest with you, that's the main thing I want to talk about in this message. But because I didn't get into certain things in the morning message I wanted to, let me bring out a couple thoughts. That because we know He is the Good Shepherd, there's a beautiful thought in this. When He says, my sheep know my voice. He says, I'm not a hireling, they are my sheep. And I want you to notice that He talks about sheep who are not part of the sheepfold yet. He talks about sheep that I'm going to die to bring them into the sheepfold. He says they still need to be called, they still need to be drawn into that sheepfold. So to me, I believe he'd be speaking about the Gentiles and about what's getting ready to happen in the church age, what we see even today, uh, as people who genuinely are seeking the voice of the shepherd are being called to the shepherd. But there's a beauty to this, that when Jesus talks about dying for us, it's not an empty thing, it's not something vain, it's not just that it is somebody who said that I'm going to give this sacrifice for them, I'm going to do whatever. It is somebody who loves you and counts you as his own. It is someone who already says you're his sheep. And that's the beauty of that statement Then when he says, my sheep know my voice and they don't answer to the voice of another. You know, the truth is, I don't believe in 
predestination in terms of who gets saved. I believe that God has forechosen how people get saved. That's by Jesus Christ. I believe He has chosen that the cost of it is Christ dying on the cross. That's salvation by grace through faith. That you know these are the ways that are pre-chosen. These are predetermined. These are predestined. And when you look at when God talks about it, He says those. But there is a certain thing to understand that God does talk about His foreknowledge and Him knowing who's going to get saved. And there seems to be something in this passage to help us understand that a little bit and appreciate that that there are some people who are actually listening for Him and there are some who are not. That's why some people, when they hear the gospel, respond and some do not. That's why some people are quick to follow after every lie and every false teacher who comes out there. And some people, when they hear the truth, their hearts are open to it. And in reality, Corinthians explains this to you. He says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe that there's a veil over the human heart, like the veil there in the temple. There's a veil over your heart. And that veil is making your heart darken so that you can't fully understand and appreciate the things of God. And it's not until somebody says, I want to know. It's not until their heart genuinely cries out that that veil can be pulled back. Because it's not God putting it there, it's us. We're putting the veil there. And so the reason why some people, you preach to them, you give them the gospel, they just don't get it, is because they've got the veil closed. They're not interested. They're listening for voices, but they're not interested in who's the real shepherd here. They're not interested in the good shepherd. Now, the other thing I say is I get ready with trying to draw this message to a close, understanding that if we're His sheep, we'll know His voice. In fact, you want a good answer about how you can know God's will? There's a lot of answers to it, but to be honest with you, if you're His sheep, you should at some point, especially by the help of the Holy Spirit, be able to recognize the voice of God. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but at some point we ought to grow enough to understand the voice of God compared to the voice of others. But all that aside, I have said every one of these things. Every I am statement is an answer. An answer to some deep-rooted need we have and using something from the Old Testament to explain that to us. Now, in truth, this one's special because this is not the only place where this illustration is used in the New Testament. You actually have two times in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2 and 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 2 tells you exactly what you just read. 1 Peter 2 tells you how that Jesus Christ went to the cross to draw us unto Him. So the Gentiles, even, he talks about, could be drawn unto Him. He went, and even though He was righteous, and He was just, and He had no sin, and He didn't know it for anybody to go to that cross, He chose to die and suffer for us. So 1 Peter 2 explains everything I just said to you, that He's a good shepherd because He chose to die to draw all men unto Him. 1 Peter 5 talks about pastors being careful because we're just a shepherd under him. That's what pastor means. A pastor means a shepherd. He's saying you're just a shepherd under him. When the chief shepherd shall appear, then he'll reward you accordingly. So it's a warning for me as a pastor to be careful and realize that you're not really my flock. I'm over this flock because he put me in charge to help take care of you and help you and make sure you're fed and so forth. But as, at the end of the day, you belong to him. You're his heritage. I'm just a servant on his behalf working to help you. And so there's a lot of beauty in that, but in the Old Testament, you have the answers. There is in the book of Psalms where he is called, uh, let me see if I can find that real quick. In the book of Psalms, uh, in chapter 80, verse 1 through 3, he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. So he's referred to as the shepherd of Israel. So they already knew him as a shepherd. And the verse is very clearly about God. I mean, the next three verses talk about God. So Jesus calling himself the good shepherd, most anybody should understand where that's going. That he's saying he is God. He is the God of Israel. That's who the shepherd of Israel is. Then the most evident one, though, is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he begins to talk about how waiting for everybody is the valley of the shadow of death. And even though we may have to pass through it, we don't have to fear it. Because the same God who in the wilderness prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies, the same God who by His rod and His staff has comforted us and took care of us and guided us every step of the way, the God who's made sure we never wanted or went without, that God who's our shepherd now will be our shepherd even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He is a caregiver who is good to us from beginning to end. He's taking care of us and being good to us. They could have understood that. Hey, you didn't need a deep theological degree. I mean, they knew what he meant if they knew anything about their Bible when he said, I am the good shepherd, because the Lord is my shepherd. They knew he was calling himself God. They knew he was declaring himself to be the very God who had cared for them and taken care of them all the way to this point. 
Now, where I tell you that's an answer to a deep need, well, it should be obvious in many ways that he's the answer because he was the sacrifice, because he laid down his life for us, because he died for us. Because there had to be a sacrifice for the sins of the world. There had to be someone who would die for us. Just like there had to be a door if you were going to get in heaven, there had to be a sacrifice. But I'm going to say it's even a little bit beyond that. Because he's not just a shepherd, he's the good shepherd. He's not just the sacrifice, he is good. And I think it's because we need someone who cares enough for us that they're willing to do what's necessary to make sure we're taken care of. Someone who loves us so much that they'll go well above and beyond what is necessary to make sure that we had salvation, that we had safety, that we were taken care of and protected from the wrath that we so deserved. What I'm saying is this. If you want to look at how he's an answer to the deep-rooted needs inside of a human heart, you need someone who loves you enough they would die for you. You need someone to love you that much that they would sacrifice themselves for you. I mean, you think parents, we do that for our kids. Husbands do that for their wives. Wives do that for their husbands. We all have relationships where we care enough we sacrifice for people. But you needed it more than just companionship. You needed it more than just someone to help you. You needed it because you needed someone who could buy you back from the sin debt that you owed. You needed someone who was able, who had power well beyond that of you because you're just a sheep in this story. You needed a shepherd who would love you so much that he wasn't going to let the wolves mess with you. He wasn't going to let anything get you. He was willing to die for you. It is a deep-rooted need within the human heart that we need a God who cares that much for us. We need a shepherd to care that much for us, that he'd be willing to lay down his life freely and willingly for us. And Jesus answered that need. Psalm 23 is not just a, a beautiful passage. It is a reality that you can see in the person of Jesus Christ who gave himself willingly and died for us because the shepherd loves his sheep so much he'd be willing to pay whatever cost. He'd lay his life down to pay the cost for us if that's what's necessary. Father, we thank you and praise you, God, for all that you do. We pray that you'd help us just to serve you. We thank you, God, for your goodness, for your blessings on us. We thank you for being so faithful and, and so caring and so kind to us in every step of our life. And again, we just want to thank you for your goodness, God. And we can't begin to imagine or, or even try to reach the depths of it. But we thank you, God, for it. Pray that you'd help us to not take that for granted, but to live uh, appreciating that every step of our lives. We ask it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here. I'll let Nick go ahead and close.